Well, hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. If you don't know who I am, my name is Jessica Likewise. I have 13 years of experience doing ABA, and now I'm studying for my BCBA exam. So today I'm gonna to make a video and talk about the defining characteristics of ABA to help you study along with me. Well, hey guys, and welcome back. Like I said earlier, my name is Jessica Likewise. I'm studying for my BCBA exam and I'm making videos so you can study along with me because sharing is caring and I believe we're in this together. So when I went back and I got this Cooper book and I started reading it, oops, sorry about that. When I started reading it, some of the content in it, I just at first was like, why? I don't understand why after 13 years in the field, I need to go back and learn these terms and definitions that frankly, I forgot about after a decade of practice. And, you know, if I thought if I didn't see them, do I really need to know them? And why is this even important? And I will admit until I actually got to the point where I'm making this particular video, part of the reason I was doing this is because I wanted there to be some sort of purpose in my studying, so helping other people. And I didn't see how it would necessarily make me a better practitioner until I actually watched this video and I started to see why it's important to know the fundamentals and principles of ABA. So I thought at first this was all about just learning definitions that probably won't come up again in terms of needing to know the definition of it when you're in practice. But really there's a lot more to it. So what are the defining characters of ABA and why do we need to know them? Well, that's a great question. There are other fields, right, other than ABI. There are other practitioners and, and there are other types of psychologists. There are also other types of behaviorists. So what sets us apart are these defining characteristics. Something is not ABA unless we, it, it meets the following criteria. And that's actually really important for us to know because there is so many people, there are so many people who say they do ABA, but aren't necessarily credentialed, like myself, to be honest with you. And I believe I practice really good ABA and really good ethical ABA, and I am studying obviously for my BCBA exam, so I will be credentialed. But there's a lot of people who say they're doing ABA who aren't, and it often gives our field a bad name. And I think a lot of the criticism that our field gets is from number one, history, and number two, from people who say they're doing ABA who are not actually doing ABA. So what is real ABA? Well, in order to be ABA, it's something an intervention has to meet all the criteria we're gonna talk about. Not one of them, not two of them, not some of them, but all of them. If an intervention does not meet all of the criteria, it's not actually ABA. Someone might be saying they're doing it, but they're not. So the first defining characteristic of ABA is all ABA must be applied. Well, what does this actually mean? That means that the behavior that someone's learning must be socially relevant to them. If something is not relevant or socially important for a respondent or a learner or a child, whoever you're working with, then we shouldn't teach it. Now, you can use ABA principles to teach just about anything. You can teach a child to touch their nose every time a car alarm goes off. But does that have any practical purpose? No, of course not. So, right, we wouldn't do it. That's not ABA. That's like, that's weird. It's like a magician trick and it's, it's not okay. It's not ethical. It's not nice, right? So, but if a child wants to have friends and wants to have social relationships, well, teaching that child how to appropriately greet their peers, that would be an important social skill for the child to have. It's socially important, it's relevant. It applies to the things that are important to them. That's a really important thing about ABA. Well, as clinicians, when we're developing treatment plans and we're developing program goals, you know, and, or IEP goals, whatever it is, we shouldn't just click, 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 click down the computer. We should try to figure out what are the most important skills for this family, for this child, so that way, whatever we're doing is relevant to their lives, right? If the child hates puzzles and never wants to see a puzzle, well, do we really need them to learn how to do a puzzle when that child really expresses an interest in soccer and doesn't have the skills to play a bet on a team sport right now? Should we be teaching soccer if that's more socially important, right? So it's not just a matter of like something ridiculous, obviously, like we know, right, touch your nose, that's when you hear a car horn or a car alarm, that's ridiculous. So any of us would, 
would see that. But it's also the little nuances of making sure that the treatment goals that we're picking reflect what's most important for a learner. The other thing is that it must be our goals, and this is the second defining characteristics, they must be behavioral. And you might say, okay, great, Jess. Good job, you know, applied behavior analysis must be behavior of like gold star. That seems so obvious. But when we're writing treatment goals, what that actually means is that whatever inter behavior that we're intervening on, it must be observable and measurable. So going to the example of the child, you know, a child playing in the playground. If we just say the child feels comfortable on the playground, well, that is not a good goal. It's not an ABA goal because it is not behavioral. It cannot be measured and observed. So everything we're trying to change, all the behaviors we're trying to change in ABA must be measured and observable and be able to be measured. So if I said, for example, the child greets three peers on the playground, you know, in a 30 minute interval, or the child is able to swing on the swing for five minutes and without engaging in crying, or the child, you know, walks around the perimeter of the playground uh, three times without getting upset. I mean, that's a silly goal whatever, you get the point. It's observable and it can be measured. So that's really, really important. So when we're writing treatment goals, we're writing intervention plans, we have to make sure whatever behavior we're intervening on is very specific, a behavior that is observable and measured, not just he's happy, it makes him sad. You know, Jill does better in math class. No, like Jill stays in her seat for the entire math class or, you know, without getting up to, washer, whatever, wash, whatever it needs to be, um, sharpen a pencil, whatever it is. So that's really important. The next defining characteristic of ABA is ABA is analytical. Well, what does that mean? It means that as a behaviorist, you must demonstrate that the intervention that you're using is actually having an effect on the behavior. Well, we know, we know about the withdrawal design, the ABA design, where we want to constantly prove that what we're doing is working, that it is actually the intervention that's changing the behavior. Now, for some behaviors, this will be easier to prove than others. So if it's like an intervention, let's just say you're using a token board and you're trying to have a child sit in their chair for a, a session, you can get a baseline. Uh, which would be no token board and then you get an average rate of responding and then introduce the token board and the behavior changes and then you take the token board away and the behavior goes back to the baseline and that's really clear sometimes it's not so clear if you're teaching a child to ride a bike you know it might be a little hard to prove the relationship between the intervention and the behavior because frankly like you can't unlearn to ride a bike you can't withdraw that design right but you do the best you can that's why we take data in sessions, right? So if something, if you're not actually taking data in ABA, it's not actually ABA by this definition. Again, this is where I'm seeing why it's important to you know these principles, because there were times even as, you know, behaviors, I'm thinking like, why do I have to collect this data? Like, why does this make sense to take discrete trial data all the time? This child's responding the same way. No, it's important because we have to actually prove that the intervention we're using is what's changing the behavior. So the other thing is that ABA must be technological. So what does that mean? It means that we have to write the steps out of what we do so other people can replicate the studies. Well, why is this as important? Because we can't just make things up haphazardly as we go, right? ABA is not about just making things up on the fly. You know, if we have an intervention, in order for that intervention to be effective, in order for to, to prove that it's working, we, to use it again, right? And other people in that child's life to be using an intervention, it has to be written down clearly and easy to follow. Because if I were to go to the parent and say, hey, I have this fantastic intervention, it's working so well for your child, and their behaviors respond, it's improved dramatically in sessions, and the parents are like, fantastic, tell us what it is and we'll do it at home. And you're like, oh, I, you know, I, I'm just kind of like giving him a high five here and there. And when he's doing good, then I, I give him a toy train. And when he's not doing good, then I take the chair away. And right, that's not ABA, right? ABA has to be written down so other people in the child's life can do the same thing that you're doing. Because we know that an intervention has to be carried out in multiple settings for it to be and by everyone in that child's life for it to be most effective. So you have to have an intervention that's written out. The other thing is that it has to be conceptually systematic. What does that actually mean? And it is, this is somewhat seems at first glance similar to technological, but it means it needs to be essentially rooted 
in the principles of ABA, so you have to, or behavior science, you have to actually prove that the intervention that you're selecting is actually based on sound behavior principles. This is right, this really relates very closely to our ethical code of don't practice outside of your scope of practice. You know, for example, um, using a sensory bin, right? This is a big controversy. A lot of behaviorists say, well, we can't do this because it's not ABA and, and, and you know, it's, it's not, right? It's, there's, but there's occupational therapists who do this and there's research on that. So, you know, can you do, can you write an intervention based on something that's not behavior science? Well, no, not and not and actually have it in have it be ABA. Now, I, I tend to personally be of the perspective that as clinicians that we have to collaborate with other professionals and that it is perfectly acceptable as long as we don't call something ABA to help a family carry out some strategies they've learned that are working for the child from another professional as long as they're ethical and um, clear and easy to understand and we don't need to be an expert to um, and we're trained on how to implement them. I do actually think it's okay in that in that case. I don't think it's practicing outside your scope. You know, for example, if a child, um, if the, the, the therapist, you know, and I always, I, I like to use this as an example. A lot of times, and I, and I know I'm kind of going on a little tangent here, but I do think this is really important. A lot of behaviors, and we're gonna even go to the sensory bin. A lot of behaviors will say, you know, there's no way we can do this. And maybe the oh, occupational therapist told the parent, every hour, give your child a sensory bin for five minutes. And the ABA therapist said, and it works really well for the family. And the family's carrying this out. And this is now part of the family's routine. And the family says to us in session, hey, you know what, our occupational therapist, they asked us to carry this out. We're doing it and it seems to be working. So can you do it as well? Some therapists, some ABA therapists will get in their high horse and say, well, no, we can't do this because, you know, it's not demonstrated by behavioral research and this is outside of my scope of practice. You know what the truth is? It is not outside of your scope of practice to give a child a bin that's filled with sand and little toys. It's not. I mean, you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to know how to carry it out, right? It's just, you just kind of do it. Now, you can't necessarily make that recommendation as a behaviorist, because it's not in our scope of practice. But if, if you're being asked to carry it out, and this is again, my little tangent, just do it. Like really, you don't need to make it so dramatic. Um, you know, again, it's not, it's really not a big deal. One of the things I like to say is, if you have a child who has an anaphylactic reaction in a session and that child is dying, and then there's an EpiPen next to them, are you going to use the EpiPen on the child or you're gonna watch them die and say, it's outside of your scope of practice and you know behavior science doesn't demonstrate that hydrocortisone will or whatever it is that an epinephrine will help stop an allergic reaction i mean obviously you're going to give a kid the epipen right so it's kind of the same thing really when it comes down to it you're not being asked to carry out something crazy so anyway total tangent but the reality is is that if you're writing an intervention it has to be conceptually sound. It has to be based upon the principles of behavior. You have to demonstrate all your, all your interventions are based on the, the principles of behavior. So the next thing about it is that the behavior must be able to be generalized. So what does that actually mean? Well, technically it means that it must be applied to new situations in untrained settings. Now we know for some of our kids, they really struggle with generalization, especially if we're using ABA for kids with autism, they may really struggle with generalizing skills on their own. So we might actually have to teach to generalization, but here's an example of some generalization. So there are two types of generalization. One of them is stimulus generalization and the other one is response generalization. So let's just say that you're teaching a child to throw a ball well, if it is not ABA, if the only ball the child can use is this pink bouncy ball and they can only do it in their living room, right? That's, that's crazy. So then you, the in order for it to really be ABA, the child would have to be able to throw a kickball and reset. They'd have to be able to throw a basketball in the gym. They'd have to be able to throw another type of ball at their friend's house, right? So that's really, that's what it comes down to, stimulus generalization. The child can engage in the same behavior with multiple stimulus, multiple stimuli. So the other thing is the, the response generalization. And this means the child must be able to use more than one, get the same um, function with in more than one way. So if the child goes into the playground and you've just taught this child, this is where AB becomes robotic to say, hi, how are you? My name is Susan, do you want to play today? 
that's ridiculous, right? You can't, they can't have only one way of responding. It's also, hey, how are you? Let's go on the slide. Hi, hello, how's your day today? Right, multiple ways of greeting the person and having the same um, function achieved. That would be really, really important. So ABA must be generalized. And this really also really intertwines with the, with the number one thing of it must be applied, right? If, if, the, if you're teaching a skill in isolation, the child's not gonna encounter that in their natural environment, then it's not ABA. The other and final characteristic of ABA is whether a behavior is effective. Now, what does that actually mean? So we said something is analytic, which means we're demonstrating that the change in the behavior is um, from the intervention. We said that something must be applied, meaning that it's important to the child. It must be generalized. They're going to be able to use it in different ways in their actual life. So what does effective actually mean and why include that? What that means is that the behavior must be changed enough to impact a child's life. And here's an example of um, one of the things that I've, I've seen a therapist make this mistake just recently. And I said, hey, wait a second, we can't discontinue this intervention. So we had a child who wanted to, the parents wanted this child and the child themselves wanted to be in a mainstream setting, but they were really struggling with sitting in their chair. Well, so an intervention was created to help the child learn to sit in their chair. And so the periods of time in which the child needed to be sitting in their chair was 45 minutes during an actual classroom session. So an intervention was implemented and the therapist had taught the child to sit in the chair for one minute in an ABA session. And then once the child reached one minute of being able to sit in their chair, they discontinued the intervention. Well, that intervention was not effective. The reason being is because the behavior didn't change enough for the child to actually be successful, right? The child could sit for one minute, but sitting for one minute is not super helpful if you wanna to go to a restaurant or to a movie or go to be in a regular classroom, a, a general education classroom. So that's not actually an effective intervention. You need to make sure that you're teaching enough of the skill for it to be useful for a child. And that's actually really important. I think probably one of the most overlooked ones that we tend to do. We tend to just, especially if we only have a two hour session period, you know, we might, or a one hour session period, we might discontinue an intervention just because we don't have a ton of time to teach it. And it's like, oh yeah, they sort of got this, but no, they can't just kind of sort of have it. It has to be enough for them to be able to successfully use the skill in their everyday lives. So I hope that you found this video helpful. You got a free little rant um, included with the price of admission, which was free for this, uh, this video on the, the characteristics of ABA on why I think we need to collaborate with other professionals. So you're welcome. Um, if you found it helpful, subscribe to this channel. I've been putting out videos just like this one on a daily basis. I took Sunday off, but other than that, I put them out every day last week. I'm going to do that again every day this week as I'm studying because we are in this together. So if you have a question for me, head to my website, hopeeducationservices.com, and I'll make a video to answer it. So have an amazing day, and I'll see you on tomorrow's video.